This morning I want to uh, turn our attention to the book of 1 Peter. Uh, we'll be in 1 Peter chapter 1. And we're just going to read the first, no I'm sorry, we're going we're to be in chapter, chapter 1 and we'll read verses 13 through 16, four verses there that we'll read together. As you're turning there, I want to remind us, of course, um, as we try to do each Sunday, our theme for this year, where we're going, our focus, just to keep it top of mind for you. I know we deal with a lot of things throughout the week, and sometimes we may get distracted a little bit of what our focus is. But remember, our theme this year is hand me another brick, right? And we try to make this relevant to your life, uh, that as we study the book of Nehemiah, and we see the walls of Jerusalem have come down and there's this yeah. rebuilding process that's taking place. But we wanted to make it personal that there is rebuilding that also needs to take place in your life. That's right. right? There are some things that, that, that maybe God wants to help you restore, uh, to help you rebuild. Wow. But not only in you, your personal life. But also when we come up into the house of God. Amen. There are some things around us in God's kingdom that we need to be about rebuilding and restoring. If there is someone here this morning who feels like uh, I have nothing to reveal in my life. Uh, Brother Overton, everything is built perfectly and fine. Um, there's, there's nothing going on in the church that I'm aware of that needs to be rebuilt. Um, everything is fine. Then I'm going to come around and I'm going to check your pulse. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And, or, or rather, if you think you're perfect, see me after worship. Yeah, yeah. Or I can take some notes and figure yeah. out how to get perfect yeah. like you. But no, but then I'm going to tell you that no, let's look closer at Scripture. Why? Because there's always work to be done in your life. Please don't ever think you have arrived. That's right. And there's nothing that needs to be built back up in your life. Right. You are not a finished building just yet. Yeah. God has work to do with you and with me. And so we want to be in this, this mindset of building. And one of the things that I want to impress upon us today from 1 Peter is that we have to do things God's way. Yeah. God's way is a holy way. Yeah. God's way is a sanctified pure way. Yes. Whatever you're dealing with, whatever you're going through in your life, you have to be willing to do things the holy way. Sometimes you can build some stuff up and feel like you're doing a good job and you're having success. But if you check and you, and you didn't build right, sometimes that those things will come tumbling down. But I want to encourage us this morning that if you build the holy way, uh -huh. if you build the right way, yes. what you build will last. Yes, it will. Because I built it the way God said to build it. <coughs> if you are married, how many married people we have? Just raise your hand if you're married. Yeah, yeah. I pray that when you built your marriage, that you built it the holy way. Yeah. That you built it according to God's way. Right. Right. Anybody got children? Raise your hand if you got children. Yeah. If you're raising children, yeah. Yeah. I pray that you are raising them the holy way. Yeah. According to what God has prescribed. That's the challenge for us. Anybody got a life to live? Yep. I pray that you live in life the holy way. That's, that's the thing. We don't like to use the word holy anymore. Think about it. When was the last time you heard a sermon on being holy? I, I can't. It's been a while. I, it don't just come to my mind. Freshly, when I've heard a sermon about holiness. So you might not say amen a lot. All right. Just listen to me. All right. And then if I'm wrong after worship, they come to me. All right. But but holiness is not something we really talk about. And I believe that it is important for a child of God to appreciate what it means to be holy. Yeah. 
I think some things kind of get in our way of appreciating what being holiness or being holy is about. We think being holy is about not having fun. You get holy, you can't have fun no more, right? I'm going to talk a little bit about that. Um, you get holy, people talk about you. They call you holy holy. Uh, you go to that sanctified church over there. Yeah, yeah. yeah thank you. If, if, if the shoe fits, I'm a word. And so it's okay. That, that, that's my term for my life. We were talking in the men's class this morning. We need to be able to say, I'm a holy man. Yeah. You're a holy woman. Yeah. Because that means something. Another thing that gets in the way is that we think holiness is something that we have or that we can do ourselves. Wow. God has done the work already yeah. for us to be declared, be declared holy. God has done the work. But now it's up to me to live in such a way. That acknowledges what he already did for me that's, on the cross. All right? And so I think that's what this text is going to help us to appreciate uh, just for the next few minutes. First Peter chapter 1, starting at verse 13. The Bible says, Therefore, gird up the loins of your mind, be sober, and rest your hope fully upon the grace that is to be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. As obedient children, not conforming yourselves to the former lusts as in your ignorance, but as he who called you is holy, you also be holy in all your conduct. Because it is written, be holy, for I am holy. Let the church say amen. amen. You just need a title for the sermon this morning. Holiness is the goal. Holiness is the goal. Someone asked you tomorrow, what was the sermon about? You talked about being holy. <laughs> All right. Holiness is the goal. These few verses here in 1 Peter really is a response to motivation to be holy. The context of 1 Peter is really Peter writing to a group of people who are really struggling. They're, they're going through some challenges, they're going through some difficulties, and their challenges that they're going through is because they're naming the name of Christ. They're naming the name of Christianity. And so they're dealing with some persecution. Um, in the beginning of this chapter, it talks about those who have been scattered into these different regions. And so these, this scattering, can, can, you can tie this back to the persecution that came under Nero when, when Rome burned and, and Jews were scattered. Um, if, you, if you continue studying that, you may see also that, that maybe it wasn't tied to those Jews had, who had been scattered, but this oppression, um, this oppression came because of the other regions that they were staying in, and the Christians, even in those other regions, were also being persecuted. So however you look at this, persecution is taking place. This, this book really also emphasizes how to conduct yourself, right. how to live the life in the midst of trials. Right. And so he addresses a number of groups to say to them how you live is important. He talks to husbands. Husbands, any of you want to know how to get better? And being a husband? It's in first Peter. Yeah. Wives, any wives want to know how to get better at being a, a better wife? It's, it's, it's in first Peter. Yeah. Um, we don't have any slaves or body servants, but if we did, yeah. he talks about it. In First Peter, we got any elders in the house this morning? Yeah. If elders want to know how to get better leadership, it's in First Peter. Right. And so, in all of these things, it's about conduct. Right. How are you living your life in the midst of your circumstance? Right. And so, it helps us here at verse thirteen, where he he lets us know that this needs to be your response out of this motivation. Well, what's the most motivation? 
The motivation is you have been born again. Look at verse 3. Here's the motivation in chapter 1, verse 3. Blessed be the God and Father, the Lord Jesus Christ, who, according to his abundant mercy, has begotten us again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead to an inheritance incorruptible and undefiled and that does not fade away, reserved in heaven for you who are kept by the power of God through faith for salvation, ready to be revealed in the last time. And so it's this great news about salvation that ought to motivate us to live a certain way. This motivation stems from the fact that we have a living hope. The hope that I have is not dead. The hope that you have is not dead. I don't care what you're going through in your life, you have some living hope. And my hope is living because my hope got up out of the grave and did not remain dead. If it was still dead, I would not have living hope. You would not have living hope. But he is risen. And because of that, he has an inheritance that he keeps reserved for me. That's kept by my faith in him. It's, it's reserved in the heavens for us. And this is a wonderful salvation. And because of this salvation, I need you to deal with life, life trials in a certain way. Because look at what he says in verse 6. In this, you greatly rejoice. Anybody thankful for what God has done for you? Anybody oh, yeah. thankful for what Christ has done for you? Amen. So he says, in this, you greatly rejoice. Though now for a little while, if need be, you've been grieved by various trials. If need be, for a little while, You've been grieved. Some things we got to go through. Yeah. If need be. Yeah. Uh, God has something that he wants to take us through. A storm that he needs to take us through that's going to challenge us if need be. For a little while. Yeah. That lets us know that trials do come to an end. But for a little while I may have to go through something for a yeah. time. I know sometimes we get impatient with God. Why am I going through this for so long? But, but if need be, for a little while, you're going to have to go through this storm. Well, how long, Lord, for a little while? Well, what's a little while? So I say the storm is over. So you get the lesson that I need for you to get. And then your, your lesson that you need to learn may come in the form of various trials. If need be. For a little while. He says, you have been grieved by various trials. We like variety when we go to the store. We don't like variety of trouble and trials in our lives. But doesn't it seem like life happens that way? That as soon as you step over this hurdle, and before you put your foot down, another storm, another trial comes your way. Or you step over this one and two of them hit you at the same time. A variety of trials can come your way. But if need be, for a little while, you experience a variety of trials. Here's the purpose of it. Verse 7 says that the genuineness of your faith, being much more precious than gold that perishes, though it is tested by fire, may be found to praise, honor, and glory at the revelation of Jesus Christ. So this is not even really about you. The storms that we go through really ain't about me. But what God is trying to get to is the genuineness of your faith. Are you a real Christian? Are you, are you serious about me? That's what God, God will say. That. Are you serious about you serving me? Well, let me see your faith in this storm, yeah. in this trial. But something can happen when we go through trials, right? 
Sometimes our faith is mixed with impurities. Your, your faith ain't pure. Um, your faith is still caught up in doing things that are that are not in line with holiness right. to God. So in the, the, the Hebrew mind and in biblical times, they understood that fire did something to the impurities with men. Right. Right. Got rid of it. They understood it in their minds. Yes. How much more this application when it comes to faith? That God will allow the fire, that he will allow the testing in our lives to remove the purities right. in your life because he is looking for a genuine faith, yeah. a pure faith, a holy faith. And so, and so this, the trials become really not about you, but what God is trying to get to, with this, which is the genuineness of our faith. Look at this, verse, verse 8 it says, whom, whom having not seen, you love. Anybody love Jesus? Oh yeah. yeah. I ain't seen him, but I love him. Yeah. I, I hadn't seen him come back in his glory yet. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but I love him. Yeah. Um, I have not seen him, yet I believe in him, right? right. I had not seen him come black back, uh, but my faith is the reality of what I believe. I haven't seen him yet, he says, yet rejoicing with joy, inexpressible and full of glory, receiving the end of your faith, the salvation of your souls. An encouragement that Peter helps us with is that when you're going through, do the best you can to look forward. Yeah. I, I know it's hard right now, by us. It's difficult now sometimes in the storms when so many things are hitting you. Yeah. But if you can look ahead yeah. to the future glory, the hope of, of Christ coming back and the salvation of our soul that even we get to experience right now because of his deliverance from sin, his deliverance in my life from death, we get to enjoy those blessings even now. Right. This salvation is so wonderful. In verse 10, he says, of this salvation, the prophets have inquired. Search carefully. Who prophesied of the grace that would come? I wonder if Isaiah, in Isaiah 53, mm -hmm. when he prophesied about, uh, about Jesus, yeah. when he said he has borne our griefs uh -huh. and carried our sorrows, yes. and the chastisement of our peace yes. was laid upon him. And by his stripes we are healed. I wonder if he just began to search carefully. Is this talking about something that's happening now? Who is this Savior that's coming? When is this going to happen? But I'm sure he realized that those things that he was doing, he was ministering to the salvation that we would now enjoy. Right. And so he says, searching what or what manner of time the Spirit of Christ he was in them indicating when he testified beforehand the sufferings of Christ and the glories that would follow. To them it was revealed that not to themselves, but to us, they were ministering the things which now have been reported to you through those who preach the gospel to you by the Holy Spirit sent from heaven. Things which angels desire to look into. This salvation is so wonderful. Yes, yes, yes. Even the angels yes. stand back right, yes. and say, God, you did that for them. Yeah. How? We didn't, we didn't get we didn't get that. I mean, there's this wonderful salvation yes. of being delivered from sin. Yes. Past, present, and future yeah, sin. Yeah. It's wonderful. Even the angels yes. want to step back and yes. look into this wonderful salvation that we have. And so if you're motivated now, if you are motivated by this salvation, this wonderful hope and news that we have in Christ Jesus, now he says in verse 13, therefore, gird up the loins of your mind. Y'all see the picture there with girding, right? In biblical times, you, if you need to move quickly, you got to gird yourself up. And so I think the NIV does a great job in translating this. It, it talks about being ready for action. Yeah. All right? 
Um, uh, and sometimes you got to gird your mind up because the problem uh, when we talk about holiness is that you have loose thinking. And, and your mindset can be the problem when God is trying to call us into a holy life. Well, the problem is, is that your thinking is off. So you got to gird up your mind. You got to gird up those loose thoughts. And then he says, and be sober, right? Uh, don't be filled with wine or intoxicating drink, right? Because you can't run and be. Oh, okay. <laughs> See somebody drinking, you know? they're trying to go this way and they're drifting. So you're not ready, right? You're not ready for what God is calling you to do. And what he's calling us to do is to be holy. So he says, and to rest your hope fully upon the grace that is to be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. And we talked about it. That's the salvation piece, right? Yeah. As obedient children. Here's another example. Anybody got children? Yeah. Um, I, you know, again, I'm in, in, in school teaching, and I wonder where are the obedient children? Oh. <laughs> you take that one. You take that one. Some of them might be listening. No, there's some. I got some good kids. But there's a lot of them where I'm like, where, where is the obedience that when your teacher says to do something, that's the end of it. Everything today is why. Change seats, why? Write a sentence, why? It's time to go to lunch, why? Everything is why. Do what I said to do. And in the same way with God, when God is asking us to do something, let's be like obedient children. God said to be holy. So that's what I need to do. I need to be holy. Here's, here's the contrast. He says, not conforming yourselves to the former lust, as in your ignorance. Holiness is about, it's, it's a distinction. Holiness is about looking at the life you used to live. Right. And now that I'm in Christ, there's a complete distinction from what I used to look like. Right, right, okay. Holiness is about in all of your conduct. Problem with us today is we want to we want to kind of bring stuff with us to the Lord. Yeah. Okay. Stuff I like I like to do. When I come to the Lord, even though it may be unholy and ungodly, I'm going to bring it over here with yeah, me. Yeah. And so we try to live in such a way that we won't let go of things. And, and what Peter is encouraging them to do, even in the midst of their struggle, is to live a holy life. Yeah. Let, don't be conformed to that way of thinking that you used to have. Amen. But I need you to be conformed to holiness. He says, but as he who called you is holy. So what's the standard? Ooh, this, is a, this is a high standard, yeah, yeah. God. But we cannot shortcut God's word. Amen. The standard says, uh, but as he who called you is holy, you also be holy in all your conduct. Amen. All your conduct. Amen. Not some of them. Amen. Not a little bit. Let me hang on to something. In all of your conduct, be holy. Why? Because God is holy. Y'all know we serve a holy God? Right. Yeah. And he's holy. He's, the word really has to do with being separated from. Right. You, you, we see it in, in the Old Testament with the tabernacle, right? the holy place. That, and that place was separated from. Cut off from. You, you, you don't, everybody don't get to go in there. That place is holy. And God is holy. He is divine. He's powerful. There's some things about his holiness. There's some aspects that we, we can't possess with God, right? He's omniscient. He's, he's omnipresent. Um, there's, there's certain things about him that we can't. But there are some things about God that he challenges us 
to live in such a way that my life is declared holy in his presence. Right. And, so, and so because God is holy, I have to make sure my life is in line and conformed with that call. I said earlier, you cannot make yourself holy. Right. Holiness is a work of Jesus the Christ. Amen. He has made us holy. And so because he has made us holy, there's nothing I can do to achieve that. But what I do have to do is walk over here to what he's made for me. Yeah, yeah. And I got to live my life in such a way that says it's worthy of what he's yeah, done for me. Yeah. That's, that's what we got to do. That's what holiness is about. We can go to Leviticus chapter 19 through 26. We really see kind of like this holy code that, that scholars talk about. Uh, where God just kind of really lays out the plan of your life and how you live. And that's really what being holy is about. It's about how you live each and every day of your life. Especially when the storms of life have come. Because isn't that when most of the time we go to those things that are self-destructive and self-sabotaging is when the storm is hit. And because you made me feel worthless, I go to this thing that makes me feel better. Or because you made me feel rejected, I'm going over here to this substance to make me feel loved. Or because of how you've made me feel, I'm going to get away from you out of my abandonment feeling. And, and I'm going to be distant from you. Those are things that we do in our lives that speak to unholy behavior. But God calls us to be holy. In my conduct. Let's look at a couple of things that he says in chapter 2. I just want to read this briefly. Chapter 2. He, for the rest of the book, he really begins to break down. Well, what, is, what are you talking about being holy in my conduct? What does it look like as I apply it? Chapter 2, he says, Therefore, laying aside all malice, yes. all deceit, yes. hypocrisy, envy, yes. and evil speaking, yes. as newborn babes desire the pure milk of the word. That you may grow thereby, if indeed you have tasted that the Lord is gracious. Yeah. There's some things we need to put aside, right? Yeah. Look at another one with me. Uh, chapter 2 and verse 11. He says, Beloved, I beg you as sojourners and pilgrims, abstain from fleshly lusts, which war against the soul. Having your conduct honorable before the Gentiles, that when they speak against you as evildoers, they may by your good works, which they observe, glorify God in the day of visitation. This is interesting. Sometimes we think holiness is about getting somewhere and hiding. When you get holy, you don't come out no more. Right. You, you don't have no more fun. People don't see you. Ain't about holiness. But holiness is about what's your conduct when you do go. Yeah, yeah. When you are invited to the party. Right, right. And when you go, what's your con conduct? Right. Christians, we can't turn up like everybody else. Right. Right. I'm sorry. Right. That's the standard. You, we we got to stop posting that online or getting turned up. Yeah. You can't turn up <laughs> like everybody else. Right. Right. That's, that's what the world is doing. Right. And I'm holy. Right? Because the text said God is holy, so I gotta be holy. So I can't do it like you do. Right. Now I'm gonna still come because I love you. Right. I'm gonna come to the party. Right. Uh, Jesus went to a party. Yeah, yeah. Yes, he and <laughs> not only did he go to the party, he said keep the party going. That's what he said. He, he did. That's in the scriptures. Yeah. But his conduct. Right. It's what it's about. Right. Lord wasn't in there getting, getting drunk and no. passing out. No. no. It's his conduct. And notice the text says that when they speak against you as evildoers, they may by your good works which they observe. Right. 
if you get if you hold it and you stay in your closet, how they how are they gonna observe your good works? They need to see the change in you. They remember the old Dino. And when they see your good works now, they say, Man, Dino got a tie on and everything. Dino is They, they see his conduct has changed. Right. And, that's, and that's what God needs to see in our lives, church. Right. Right. That there is a distinction from what I used to do. Right. And y'all know what you used to do. I, I thought about naming stuff. <laughs> I thought about it. But you know. Yeah. You, know right? yeah. you know those things you held on to kind of yeah. kept in your back pocket. No. God is saying no. Get rid of that. Right. I'm looking for a holy people, a holy priesthood, that you can lift up holy sacrifices unto me. That's what God is looking for. And sometimes we don't talk about this because he also says fleshly lust. Um, and this is something that's not preached. You know, when we talk about sexual immorality, you know, that ain't a sermon you really don't want to hear about anymore these days. Um, and, and, and another reason I think sometimes that we don't hear a lot about holiness and sexual immorality is that sometimes some of the stuff that's happening out there happens right up in there. So, so from the pulpit to the last pew, it's this stuff that's going on that's immoral. And so then you say, well, if you get up there and preach about it, then that means you're a hypocrite. Man, God's word is true. Right. Yes. Well, well, no, no matter who preaches it, yeah. God's word is true. Now, we got to live by it, yeah. right? Yeah. And so we got to preach it that it might prick somebody's heart. Right. Yeah. It might even change the preacher's heart. It might even change the last person on the back yeah. of his heart. Yeah. But you preach the word of God. Yeah. First. Thessalonians 4, go over there with me. We looked at this uh, a few weeks ago on a Wednesday night uh, Bible class, but I need, us to under I need us to understand the will of God for our lives. And I'm almost done. Um, 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. Can you get that up there for me? There we go. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. I'm going to start at verse 1. Holiness, right? Finally then, brethren, we urge and exhort in the Lord Jesus that you should abound more and more. Just as you receive from us how you ought to walk and to please God. See, holiness is about how you walk and how you please God. For you know what commandments we gave you through the Lord Jesus. For this is the will of God. Anybody want to know what the will of God is for your life? You ever asked any questions, Lord, do you, what do you have for me? For this is the will of God, your sanctification. That you should abstain from sexual immorality. That you should know how to possess. Uh, let me say that again. That each of you should know how to possess his own vessel. In sanctification and in honor. Yeah. The word sanctification is really tied to the same word for holy. Right. It's about being separated from, for, for a specific purpose. Anybody sanctified in here? Has God called you out of the world for something? Yeah. Come on, raise your hand. You, you sanctified, church. Yeah. God has sanctified you. See, those are things that we try to shout out with mind. Sanctified you. Yeah. Yes, you are. God has called you out of the world. You've been set apart. Right. You are a holy people. And it's okay to say I'm a holy woman. Right. I'm a holy man. That's right. Because my God is holy. Yes. So he says that your sanctification, that you abstain from sexual immorality. Uh, verse 5, not in passions of lust, like the Gentiles who do not know God. Verse 6, that no one should take advantage of and defraud his brother in this matter. This is 
is interesting. This text suggests that we can take advantage of each other. And the way that we end up taking advantage of each other is that we are brothers and sisters in Christ. So there's a relationship that's just, we, we, we've been born of God. Right. So she's my sister. There's, there's an automatic affection that is born into the family of God. But what can happen in the church is that because of the relationship that we have, I can manipulate that relationship. I can take advantage of the relationship that we have. Because I have a fleshly desire. And I know she's going through something. I know she's struggling. Or it could be the other way around. She know I'm struggling. it on the man. Sister, y'all too. But, but I can know she's going through something. Yeah. And so in my kindness and affection and brotherly love, yeah. I'm really setting the scene to get close to her. Yeah. Yeah. So I say, let's, I know you're supposed to get some coffee. Let's go have coffee. Yeah. 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 I'm taking advantage of yeah. the relationship. Yeah. Yeah. And I now am cheating her. Yeah. And making people come in and they'll I can't remember what they call the scam, but they try to cheat the talent. They'll put a hundred dollar bill and they'll say, give me uh, five twenties for this. And then they'll quickly put another 50 down and say, give me uh, two twenties and a 10 and another 20. Before you know it, you didn't gain this person an extra hundred dollars. That's the same thing that happens. I'm cheating her. I'm, I'm scammed. I'm taking advantage of the relationship that we had. And that's a dangerous thing to do. Because, look at what it's saying. Because the Lord is the avenger of all such. There's certain things God is watching. He's watching everything, but there's some things in Scripture God got a close eye on. Right. He's watching how you hug that brother. Yeah. Yeah. Or my first, he's watching how you talking to that sister. Talking real nice to her. Well, okay. What's your motivation behind how you talking to her? That's the stuff that God is paying attention to. We are in a holy covenant with each other. Our relationship is holy before God. So we cannot be about defrauding our relationship. Not in the house of God. Holy covenant. And we got to talk about those things like this. So let's, let's move. So he says, for the Lord is the avenger of all such, as we also forewarned you and testified. For God did not call us to uncleanness, but in what? Oh. Holiness. Yes. Therefore, he who rejects this, you don't reject man. You rejected God, right. who has given us right. his Holy Spirit. Amen? Amen. Two things real quick, and I'll be done. Back at First Peter, things that add to the motivation for us to live holy lives. First Peter chapter one verse eighteen says, "Knowing that you were not redeemed with corruptible things like silver and gold, from the aimless conduct received by the tradition of your fathers, but with the precious blood of Christ." Yes. As a lamb without blemish and without spot. My holiness, how I'm living my life. I wasn't redeemed. You weren't purchased with, with the debit card. Come on, You weren't purchased with a master card, yeah. cash, gold, no. Right, right, right. Those are things that are corrupt. Right. Right? But, but, but you were redeemed with blood. Amen. That, that means somebody's had 
died for you. That's serious. Somebody died for you, and not just anybody, but the Son of God came and died for you. That's why it says precious blood of Christ died for you. It's my motivation to be holy. Another thing he says, look at verse 22. Since you have purified yourselves and obeyed the truth through the spirit and sincere love for the brethren, love one another fervently with a pure heart. That's right. Having been born again, not of corruptible seed, but incorruptible, through the word of God, which lives and abides forever, because as or all flesh is as grass, and all the glory of man as the flower of the grass, the grass withers, and its flowers fall away, but the word of the Lord endures forever. Yeah. Now this is the word which by the gospel was preached to you. Right. So not only is the blood for me, but then the word of God has this, this purifying work yeah. that is taking place in my life. Yeah. His blood with the word is, is working on me. Yeah. And all of these things are happening to inspire us and encourage us. Live a holy life. Yes. Live a holy life. He's done so much for us. Yes, he has. I'm going to close with this. Uh, I've been, I go online and listen to some, some ministers, just little snippets. And I've been hearing some lately about church hurt. Yeah. And, and the ministers, in my opinion, have kind of been on the defense to say, okay, you talk about church hurt. Well, when you go to the club, Come on. you okay. get hurt at the club. But when you go, you know, yeah. a yeah. other places, hurt yeah. happens there and you still go there. Yeah. And so why when you come into the church now, oh, it's this is especially hurt if you don't check. It's church hurt, okay? Yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm more so on the other side. Yeah. Church hurt is real. And I believe the reason why church hurt hurts is because we're not living holy life. So everything that we used to do out in the streets, we bring up into the church. So if I was chasing women out there, if you were chasing men out there, you come into the church house, and if your behavior ain't changed, I got a row of sisters over here that, that you can try to take advantage of. Holiness says, that my life out there has changed. Yes. So that when I come up in the house of God, it's manifesting right. that I have a changed life. That's why church hurts happens. Yeah. It's because we haven't let go of stuff. Yeah. We, we never really got converted. Right. And so we bring all of that in here. So yeah, you don't get hurt. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Because if, if that's the way I used to live, and I'm talking about me, I'll bring that in here, you you, you got to get hurt yeah. by me. Yeah. The church, we got to change that. Yes. we got to begin to change how the community sees the church. <laughs> Don't know that we, we got to change that, oh, I'm going to go there and, and get hurt. No, you're going to come here and get help. Amen. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go to the Northeast Church of Christ and find some help for my, my problems, my struggles, my trials. I'm going to that church. The people in there, the, the ministers ain't trying to take advantage of me. The sisters ain't trying to take advantage of me. The brothers ain't. No, they really try to help somebody in yeah. that church. Yeah. I don't know what that church is doing around the corner, but this church, they ain't got help in people. There's some holy people. Yeah. Yeah. And they ain't afraid to tell you that they're holy. They, they, they're not afraid to tell you that they never say goodbye to Yeah. Being holy ain't about you being perfect. Let me say that. Yeah. Ain't about you being perfect. But it's about you understanding that the blood of Jesus cleanses you. Right. And when you fall, you get back up and you, you try to push that stuff away out of your life. That's 
what repentance is about. And so, yeah, the church is a hospital. And we need to remind people, yeah, come on in. To a real hospital. Get some help that you need. Uh, this may be the place that you want to plant and serve and grow and mature. Yeah, that's great. Or maybe, maybe somebody just needs to come in and get, get through a season in their life. Yes. This yes. needs to be the yes. place yes. that people come. Yes. Say, man, I got help from my marriage. Yes. I'm ready to leave. Yeah. But man, I went up there, man, those brothers and sisters prayed for me, man. Yeah. Read yeah. books and studying together. I got some help. Yes. My child was going through a struggle, man. I know my yes. child was going to make it. I went to the Northeast Church of Christ, man. They helped me. They helped my child. He got baptized a few weeks ago. Yes. That's, the, that's the type of stuff yes. that we want to be able to say to the community. Yes. And when we talk to people, yes. man, we, we sanctify here. It's all right. right. We ain't scared of that word. Right. Right. Man, I'm trying to live a holy life. Yes. Right. That's what I'm about. Right. And in my marriage, I'm going to build that thing on Yeah, yeah. For my children, I'm going to build that thing yeah. on holiness. On my job, I'm going to build that thing on yeah. holiness. How I live ought to be a reflection of God in my life. Yeah. Yeah. If you're here this morning and you've been living in such a way that it doesn't say God is with you, well, I want you to get God in you. Yeah. And the way that you come to God is through His Son, Jesus Christ. Yeah. He died on the cross. That's Sin stands in the way of a genuine relationship with God. Yes. Your prayers alone are not good enough. You trying to live a righteous life is not good enough. You need the blood of Jesus yes. to wash away all of your sins, past, present, and future. And you can have that this morning by coming to Christ, confessing Him to be your Lord and Savior. We'll baptize you in the watery grave of baptism. You will rise a new creature in Christ, yes. a new man, a new woman. That says I'm ready to live a holy life. Yes. Maybe we just need to pray for you this morning. You got some challenge. You got some stuff you want to bring to the church. And say, hey, y'all pray with me on this. I'm trying to make a change in my life. And I need your help. We can pray with you. We yes. love to pray. We love to walk with you. Through your storms. Through your trials. Amen. We'll do our best to be there for you. That's what you desire. Come now while we stay in the song. Stay in the same song. Stay in the same song.